Today is the final installment of BEMA's Executive Order 9066 at 80 Speaker Series. Um, today we're absolutely thrilled to be welcoming um, activist, author, and producer Frank Abbott. Before we get to his introduction, um, we're just gonna pause to acknowledge that the land that we stand on um, before colonization, this was the home of the sovereign people of the Suquamish or the Suquab Nation. Um, we acknowledge with gratitude their past and present stewardship of the land and waters that surround us. We acknowledge our history of colonialism and we pay respect to their elders, both past and present, as they continue to live and protect the land and their culture for future generations. Um, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Prism Cultural Programs, the City of Bainbridge Island, Kitsap County, KCTS 9, and Puget Sound Energy for their sponsorship of the EO 90668A series. Now, for nearly two decades, Frank Abe has been instrumental in recovering the story of the largest organized resistance to the World War II incarceration of Japanese Americans. He helped produce the first Day of Remembrance media events that publicly dramatized the campaign for redress for American wartime concentration camps. <clears throat> He promote, produced Conscious in the Constitution, which we screened uh, here last month as part of our EO 9066 at 80 series. Um, he's the author of the graphic novel, We Hereby Refuse, um, which forms the stories that he'll be talking about today. Can you please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Mr. Frank Albert. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Gosh. Thank you all for coming out. I mean, this is amazing. Uh, such a beautiful day. And what a beautiful space this is. I mean, I've never been here before to uh, uh, BEMA, as you say. And uh, it's just, I'm just floored by the uh, facility you have here. So, you know, I really appreciate all the support you've given the museum. Um, you know, Bainbridge, I'm glad to be here in Bainbridge because, you know, Bainbridge Island is where the mass removal uh, first started. Uh, 80 years ago, uh, 227 islanders were moved on March 20th, uh, 80 years ago last month, uh, and spent four years in American-style concentration camps, as you probably well know. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you about uh, uh, three stories of resistance uh, to that mass uh, incarceration, which I covered in my film, uh, Con Constitution, which I uh, thank you for coming to the screening last month. Uh, this is in the year 2000, and more recently I covered it in my new graphic novel, uh, we hereby refuse, uh, published in, in May by Chin Music Press of Seattle. And I, I want to apologize in advance that the book is not available in a gift shop today. Uh, we, we ordered a third printing of 5,000 copies. And this is the, kind of the joys and, and, and pain of being a, a small press, is that uh, they can only afford to print like 3,000 at a time. And we, we blew through 6,000 copies, 6, copies right away. And so. Oh, thank you. And I, so again, I want to apologize. We ordered, I said, Bruce, this time order 5,000 this time. And uh, there's a fellow in the back row, Steve Quinn from Alaska, who actually provided a bridge loan to, to the publisher to get 5,000 more copies printed. And they, they're still working their way through that, that doggone supply chain. And, uh, 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 and it'll be here, like they say, in a few weeks. Uh, so uh, I'll have some postcards here. Uh, you can uh, order the book from uh, chinmusicpress.com Music, Chin uh, or you can go to their shop, which is a beautiful little shop in Pike Place Market, right, right below the, uh, the, the Flying Fishmonger uh, in Pike Place Market and uh, get, the, get the book there from Bruce. And we'll have a book signing there, I think, in, in May or June, whenever the books arrive and, and do a little, like, a little uh, uh, ad hoc book signing. Or the Wingloop Museum, or, or again, from chinmusicpress.com. Um, this being, uh, my, myself being a, a re retired King County employee, uh, I want to uh, do the duty of introducing our, our elected officials in the audience. And I'm really honored that uh, my friend uh, Clarence Moriwaki, your new Bainbridge Island City Council member, is in the front row joining us today. So thank you, Clarence. Wait for your audience. Um, uh, uh, you're really lucky to have uh, a dutiful and, and uh, you know, uh, talented uh, elected official in, in Clarence. Uh, so, uh, so again, uh, the graphic, graphic novel, We Hear By Refuse. A common to both of these projects is the story of James Omura, uh, a native of Winslow, born under the name of Utaka Matsumoto in 1912, 
attended uh, Winslow Public Schools, Bainbridge Island High School, or Bainbridge High School. And, uh, and, and James uh, ran away from home. I sh uh, or left, he left a troubled household in Winslow, uh, went to live in Seattle, and graduated from Broadway High School. He later moved to San Francisco before the war, and then he would moved to Denver before the mass eviction occurred on the West Coast, uh, and there he would uh, editorialize, be the only journalist of any race to support the uh, resistance inside the camps. And I'm, I just want to introduce James right now. We'll come back to him, uh, uh, to this Bainbridge Island native uh, later. Uh, so now to understand the topic today of resistance and the fight for justice, uh, we really first have to understand or ask the question, what were they resisting against, right? Um, we can get a good idea by looking at this uh, uh, Seattle Times headline uh, from March 30th, 1942. Uh, which you probably saw in the, in the Times recently on the front page, uh, being revisited by, uh, by uh, their project of, of revisiting the past and redressing the past. Um, in the profession, we like to say that uh, the uh, journalism is the first draft of history. And uh, the Seattle Times, like I say, did a brave thing uh, in looking back at their own first draft of the mass removal from Bainbridge Island. And with hindsight, a number of things jump out. Um, here's the front page, again, uh, on the top you see a uh, uh, first photo of Jap destruction at Cavite Navy Yard. And then below it, you'll see, um, you know, tears, smiles as Japs uh, uh, mingle. Uh, tears, smiles as, as Japs bid Bainbridge farewell. Uh, so these kinds of things, you know, for years and years I look at these headlines and, and just kind of shrug. Uh, you know, well, those were different times, and that, those are the racial slurs they used. Uh, but what's interesting now is that, you know, after experience that I've had as a journalist at Cairo News Radio for 14 years, and as a communications director for the King County Executive, uh, just retired, uh, I, look at, I look at this, and, and now it suddenly becomes quite clear what's going on here. Um, you know, the, the Japs, uh, Bomb Pearl, the Navy Yard, and the Japs were evicted from Bainbridge. And the slur, the use of the same derogatory slur for Japanese to refer to both the Japanese military and the Japanese Americans here on Bainbridge creates a kind of false equivalency in the mind of the reader. Uh, they bombed the US. Uh, well, of course, they can't be trusted and must be somehow uh, sanctioned. Uh, the use of the term for both groups confirms in the public mind the linkage of American citizens with a Japanese enemy. And it validates the notion that will come up later that ancestry determines identity, not just loyalty, but identity. Um, so now you look at this uh, a relentlessly happy spin that our correspondent uh, Fieldy Lemon uh, puts on this uh, uh, coverage uh, of Bainbridge. Superficially, you know, it's sympathetic coverage. Uh, but it embraces a number of the common tropes of the time. Uh, some leave in tears, some leave in, some with smiles. You know, does anyone really think that anyone was happy to be forced from their homes at the point of bayonets? Uh, the evacuation, uh, where was it? The evacuation was a credit to the efficiency of the army. This comes up a lot in this article. Um, the soldiers courteously escorted the Japanese aboard the ferry. Uh, the subtext here is, you know, the public is being told that there was no violence involved here, no mass uprising, no refusal. They went quietly. The people left their homes without bloodshed. Um, all is well. And overall, you get the idea that of, of Japanese Americans as pioneers going on a grand adventure, happily doing their part for the war effort. And every Japanese American quoted in the story uh, was depicted as cheerfully resigned to their fate and even proud to do their part. And not one of them is asked by Field and Lemon, do you think this is right, what's, what's happening here? Um, the most sympathy in the story is reserved for a girl who had to leave her kitten behind, a human interest. So this kind of news coverage you know, served to assuage the fear and ignorance of the Seattle public. It, it eases their guilt. Uh, it, it assists them in looking away 
because even though Japanese Americans may have ended up crying, they're also smiling, right? They're also, they're, and they're not resisting. So this is the prevailing public mood that anyone who wants to challenge incarceration is up against. And what you see here is that there was no um, mass resistance to the initial removal from Bainbridge and Seattle and the West Coast. Um, the stories I will tell you today uh, take place after that mass removal, after the eviction, when Japanese Americans uh, have been in uh, camp for a few years or a year or two. Uh, in our graphic novel, our story is told by three characters in their early 20s. And, and these are adults with agency. Uh, they're not children in camp, you know, who don't understand why the adults are always arguing, uh, why it's so dusty, why the food's so bad. They're, they're grown-ups who must make choices about every decision that is successively demanded of them by the government. Jim Okutsu. Uh, okay, I didn't want to do that. Uh, Jim Okutsu uh, refuses the draft at Minidoka. Hiroshi Kashiwagi of Sacramento refuses government pressure to sign the loyalty oath at Tule Lake, but yields the family pressure to renounce his U.S. citizenship. And Mitsuya Endo of Sacramento refuses a chance to leave the camp at Topaz so that her case could reach, ultimately, the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, about the Supreme Court, you probably very well familiar, you've heard about the stories of Ninya Sui, Fred Korematsu, and Gordon Hirabayashi. Come on in, have a seat. Uh, whose cases all reached the high court. Uh, Min, Min, on the left here, uh, Portland, uh, objected to the military curfew being applied only on the basis of race. Uh, Fred Korobatsu, San Leandro, Bay Area, wanted to stay with his Italian-American fiance, who was in love. Uh, Gordon of Seattle, you all know Gordon, uh, Hirabayashi, violated both the curfew and the exclusion order as a matter of conscience. He's a pacifist, he's a CEO, he's a Quaker, American Friends Service Committee. So these names you, you may have heard of, if not intimately know. But there was a fourth case to reach the US Supreme Court. And, and until now, Mitsuya Endo was just a name on a court docket, court brief, in, in the history books. We, in our book, we show you how she was a person, as a person. Uh, in brief, she was a key punch operator in Sacramento for the state of California. And after Pearl Harbor, the state uh, moves to suspend all employees of Japanese ancestry uh, on the basis of race. Uh, Endo joins a group of 63 Nisei State employees who organize to contest their termination, and they hire an attorney, a guy named James Purcell. But in the middle of their case, of their organizing, the Army evicts all Japanese Americans from the West Coast, including Sacramento, uh, and Endo is bused to the Sacramento Assembly Center, former migrant labor camp. And what is kind of amusing about this situation is how this removal enables the state personnel board to make the tortured argument that it could fire all of its Nisei state employees because they hadn't shown up for work. <laughs> all right, uh, great. So James Purcell goes to visit uh, uh, Endo, wants to bring a federal habeas corpus case uh, petition uh, uh, to make the government produce, produce the body, if you will, to, to uh, force uh, the end to, de to detention. But he needs to find what he calls the perfect plaintiff. And Purcell, he himself grew up in a prison as a son of a guard at Folsom. So he, he could say, you know, I know a prison when I see one. Uh, uh, and, and Purcell goes shopping among his clients, uh, the state employees, for, and chooses Endo because she didn't speak Japanese, didn't attend Japanese language school, like many did, and had a brother in the U.S. Army. So she, she actually kind of ticks all these boxes uh, as the perfect plaintiff for his case. And she shakes hands to signal her agreement. Now, the lawyers for the War Relocation Authority, the, the civilian agency that's operating these camps, uh, know that they're violating the uh, Constitution, the principles of habeas corpus, produce the body. And they send their chief uh, solicitor to make a deal with Endo. Uh, the government lawyer offers her a chance to leave camp and go 
anywhere she was, so long as she's not back to the West Coast. Uh, and of course, Endo wants her freedom. Uh, so this is a critical decision for her. If she leaves camp, takes the offer, uh, uh, and gets her freedom, that would render her habeas corpus case moot. Uh, so she can do what's best for herself or do what's best for the good of all. And she decides to do what's best for all. I am willing to go as far as I can on this case, she says. Uh, it meant for her, it meant staying in camp for another two full years until her case finally reaches the US Supreme Court, which rules that the Roosevelt administration had no legal right to detain admittedly loyal US citizens for an indeterminate length of time. This decision prompts the Army to uh, revoke the West Coast Exclusion Zone in 1944, December, and the WRA announces it would close the camps within six months to a year. And, and we get uh, this picture, uh, never before seen, of uh, Mincio's happy dance in, in camp when she gets the telegram about her court victory. Uh, she and her friend uh, are very, uh, celebrate by dancing in their barrack. Uh, so, in brief, that, that's the story of, of Mitsuya Endo, uh, uh, who she was uh, as a person. This is her, her leading camp. Um, she would go on to um, work for the mayor of Chicago, decline all interviews, not talk to her kids about it, uh, and, um, you know, feeling she had done her bit, but not wanting publicity and, and talking about it. So, you know, by contrast with, you know, Korematsu has a family foundation, Hirabasu has books written about him and plays written about him. Uh, Yasui was, you know, happy to talk about the case to anyone who would listen when he was alive, uh, and his daughter made a film about him. They're celebrated, Mitsuya Endo, uh, unknown until now, so very happy to kind of restore her place, and, and, and the story of a woman, the story of a woman uh, in, in this incarceration resistance story. Um, so that's her story. Um, now let me turn to uh, Hiroshi Kashiwagi, uh, who's also from Sacramento, uh, and the second form of camp resistance I want to talk about, which is that of the rejection of the loyalty oath. <clears throat> and this is going to be a very difficult discussion to have, because it's the one that's really the most misunderstood uh, and, and not really well taught in schools even. So about 10 months after the uh, mass removal, the government distributes this loyalty questionnaire, February 1943. Why a loyalty questionnaire? <laughs> well, what begins as a seemingly simple problem to solve a, a simple problem uh, gradually becomes a classic bureaucratic bungle between two agencies, one military and one civilian. Uh, first, many young Nisei men wanted a way to prove they were just as American as anyone else uh, by volunteering for the army. A lot of guys wanted to do this, you know, um, in the in fight against fascism. And, and then they were right to do so. Uh, and you, you've no doubt heard a lot about them. But the army, having effectively branded the Japanese in America as untrustworthy by the very fact of locking them up and, and, and having those headlines, that, as I showed you in Bainbridge, um, but by, by the fact of branding them as, as disloyal, and I think they now needed a reverse PR campaign, right, to, to clear these volunteers for military service because the public doesn't want, you know, uh, they, they want them pointing the guns in the right direction, quite frankly. Right? So by the same token, the mission of the War Relocation Authority was to eventually relocate families into homes and jobs in the East and Midwest, take them out of camp, and move them into the, into the heartland. And it too needed a way to clear them for resettlement. You know, people in you know, Ohio did not want uh, a Nisei girl coming to their Oberlin College uh, and, and, and have this nagging suspicion that, well, they, they locked them up on the West Coast. There must be something wrong with them. You know, uh, they want to be assured that they were you know, somehow cleared. And, and government being government, they, they come up with what for them is the perfect paper trail, which is a loyalty oath. And the WRA and the Army combine their questions into one form. And so let's stop and consider for a moment. Uh, uh, is a questionnaire 
or an oath really an effective way to root out potential spies or saboteurs? <laughs> okay, you're, you're way ahead of me, right? <laughs> okay, you're way ahead of me. You know, if I were a Japanese sleeper agent, you know, burrowed into the West Coast for years by Tokyo, would I give myself up voluntarily? Okay, you got it, you got it, okay. <laughs> But we laugh now, but I mean, this uh, compounding what was increasingly becoming a, a, a major bureaucratic bungle was the simple fact that the government is asking you to affirm your loyalty to the country after you know, it had separated fathers from their families, after it had removed families from their homes, livelihoods, and freedoms. Uh, so it's not, it's not asked in a vacuum. Uh, uh, the answers are tainted by anger, rage, and frustration. Uh, many said, look, if you ask me these questions before taking everything away from us and treating us like the enemy, when we're not, we would be happy to answer yes on these, on these forms, uh, but not now. Uh, so further aggravating uh, this bungle is the fact that uh, no one, not even the camp directors, uh, understand, know the consequences of a yes or no answer. So what happens if you answer no? Uh, will I be taken from my family? Will I be sent to another jail? Uh, will I be shot you know, or deported? I don't know. The army sends recruiters to camp to enlist for volunteers, enlist volunteers, but um, fail to give the recruiters a simple FAQ uh, to deal with all the questions hurled their way. Um, if I answer no to the question about volunteering, am I automatically enlisting for the army? If I answer I'm sorry, if I, answer, if, you, if I answer yes to the question 27, am I automatically volunteering? And if I answer yes to the question 28, uh, am I... If I answer yes, will you swear on qualified allegiance to the United States of America and faithfully defend the United States from any and all attack by foreign domestic forces? Well, that, you know, that was an easy, yes, easy yes. And forswear any form of allegiance or obedience to the Japanese emperor. Okay, so Mr. Recruiter, if I answer yes to that, um, am I admitting to, uh, that I was really loyal to the emperor before, you know, okay, and, and then is that, be, it, can that then be used as evidence against me in some kind of hearing down the road? Uh, uh, and the recruiters have no clue because this is, again, this is all made up uh, on the spot. The, the government has never incarcerated a uh, mass of people, well, since they're in, in, in Indian relocation, of course, but not, not their citizens. Uh, uh, so, Hiroshi Kashiwagi has to answer this questionnaire, like everyone else. And by this time, you know, uh, one year into the war, one year into the imprisonment, uh, he and many others are simply fed up with the government's continually demanding that he prove his loyalty. And he refuses the, the pressure to sign the loyalty oath. His feeling is, I'm sick of saying yes to everything. Yes, I'll go to camp. Yes, I'll serve in the army. Yes, I'll declare my loyalty. I'll prove my loyalty by standing to my rights as an American. So. Hiroshi holds fast and refuses to sign the questionnaire. So, what does this questionnaire accomplish? Uh, all it accomplishes is it creates an administrative class of people who on paper uh, had to be categorized as not loyal when they refused to answer or they answered no. Uh, Hiroshi had committed no acts of disloyalty. He, he never, you know, all he's done is put down answers on a piece of paper under threat of prison time and stiff fines, by the way, on a poorly understood questionnaire for which no one has any idea of the consequences. So um, what the government does is take these 120,000 forms and sort them into two piles, you know, yes or no, you know, two piles of papers. And then Congress <laughs> then pressures the WRA to segregate those in the no pile uh, from the yeses. We've got to separate these guys, okay? Uh, so the uh, WRA uh, obliges Congress by fortifying one of their 10 camps uh, as a segregation center. And it chooses, just, it chooses Tuvi Lake uh, on the California Oregon border as its segregation center and fortifies it, uh, moves in 12,000 from the other camps uh, whose names are in the no pile. Oh, by the way, and, and think of 12,000 um, out of 120,000. I did the math and I realized that's one in every 10 men, women, and children locked up in these camps. 10% refused the questionnaire, still a minority, uh, but a significant uh, uh, mass resistance. Uh, uh, as I say, it fortifies uh, Tuvi Lake, adds more watchtowers, a uh, double manproof fence, and builds a military stockade inside to hold uh, inmate leaders. This, this is a, a prison within a prison. 
In most texts, uh, this is um, commonly, this is the chapter usually referred to as a question of loyalty, as if it were a simple question upon which one could be judged. Um, our, our book kind of rejects that framing and turns it on its head because, you know, a question of loyalty places the onus on the incarcerees. No, like I said, we flip that on its head. And uh, as several Tullians said at the time, it's not a question of our loyalty, it's the country that's not loyal to us. It's to its own principles, not loyal to the Constitution. Uh, it is government expediency that creates a class of disloyals, not the incarcerees, through a purely bureaucratic act. It's only disloyalty on paper, not by action. And under law, you can't be prosecuted for your thoughts, only for your overt acts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. As the government, uh, by establishing a separate prison camp, that creates the conditions then for further unrest. Uh, and all during this time, still, you know, on the outside, members of Congress still agitating. They've been trying to strip the Nisei of their U.S. citizenship for years and deport everyone to Japan. Attorney General Francis Bill tells them, can't do that. Uh, violates the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which guarantees uh, birthright citizenship to anyone born on U.S. soil. So Congress, July 44, you know, two and a half years into the, into the camps, they find a workaround, um, and Biddle suggests this. Uh, it passes the Denaturalization Act, which for the first time enables a U.S. citizen to voluntarily renounce their citizenship during time of war. Uh, the beauty, if you will, of this idea is that why pass a law that will be overturned as unconstitutional, as unconstitutional on appeal, when you can get these angry, uh, frustrated, confused people in camp to voluntarily surrender their citizenship. And many families walk into this trap, including that of Hiroshi Kashiwagi. Hiroshi uh, signs the uh, renunciation papers under pressure uh, from his family and others in camp, uh, immediately regrets his decision, as do many others. And they all desper desperately try to withdraw their petition, but they can't. DOJ won't let them. Uh, so our, our story shows that, you know, how this change from a relocation camp to segregation center creates the conditions for unrest at one particular place, Tule Lake. Tule Lake, as I say, converted to a high security prison. And, and when you have a prison, you inevitably create prison gangs uh, with pressures for repatriation for, to Japan, expatriation, denaturalization denationalization, renunciation, and ultimately deportation. The 18,000 people who are pushed into the segregation center can see how this government has simply abandoned them or turned against them overtly. Uh, and all they have to find strength in and pride in is themselves, quite literally the skin on their backs. I mean, the, the, all they have is their racial ancestry. It's all they have left. Uh, they won't, if they've renounced their citizenship, uh, and they're in prison, and the war's still going on who, for who knows how long. Uh, anger, frustration, and isolation uh, boil over into organization at Tule Lake. And so these are the so-called pro-Japan fanatics at Tule Lake. Um, you know, you see them characterized in movies like, uh, uh, not, not, not Snow Falls either, um, Come See the Paradise. Uh, you, you'll see guys with, you know, the Japanese headbands, and they're all yelling pro, you know, bonsai, bonsai, bonsai. Uh, but, you know, we show how these groups were a product of the duress of mass incarceration, mass imprisonment, and segregation. Uh, you know, after all, just, if you stop and think, was there a Back to Japan movement before the mass eviction from their home? Thank you very much. <laughs> right? No. Uh, as one young, one, young, one young man put it at the time, um, for the first time I feel good about being Japanese in America because Doggone it, it's all they have left is their, is their ancestry, um, nothing else. Uh, it's, in this, it's in this environment that seven of every ten Nisei at Tule Lake voluntarily surrender the U.S. citizenship, including Hoshikashi Wagi. Uh, he caves to family pressure to renounce. Uh, their, they act under duress from the government and also coercion from gangs the government knowingly allows to run wild with only rumor and misinformation to guide them. As one character says, how convenient 
for the government to give us this chance to self-deport. And we walked right into the trap. 5,000 uh, eventually uh, renounced at to the lake, and several thousand, uh, in fact, did uh, expatriate or repatriate to Japan uh, during the war. So, Hiroshi Kachiwagi, this was his story, uh, and to the lake. And, and is, this is, you know, uh, the one reason why you see people from Tule Lake today, uh, the survivors often will not self-identify as being from Tule Lake. They'll, they'll admit it if you press them, uh, but they just don't want to talk about it because it's just too hard to explain what I just, what I, what I just explained to you. And what I just, what I just explained to you is, is kind of not commonly or thoroughly understood by my own community. Right, Clarence? I mean, Clarence, I mean, you know, this, this is kind of a, a fresh way of looking at it, uh, an accurate way, but it's, it's just been 80 years, right? 80, 75, 80 years of misunderstanding, myth, and, and, and uh, bias built up against those from Tubi Lake. So, the third form of camp resistance comes one year after all this mess. Uh, this is the um, drafting of the Nisei from the camp. So, January 1944, the War Department uh, begins a program. I, I mentioned the volunteers to the Army before in 43. A year after that, the, the Army says, okay, we'll begin to, uh, we need more men. Uh, and we, the, the program of, of volunteers from the camps was not as productive or successful as we had hoped it would be. So it's, we need to draft these guys from camp. Uh, and we got a program of compulsory, compulsory military conscription of men who have been in prison in American concentration camps. Uh, again, many welcomed the chance to serve and, and prove they were just as American as everyone else. And, and the Japanese American Citizen League argues this is a chance to you know, have equal response. If we, if we want equal rights, we have to have equal responsibilities. And that's a fair argument. Uh, and, and, and the draft gives us a chance to reclaim one of our rights of citizenship, to, which is to serve in the army. Many welcome the chance to serve. And, uh, but to men like Jim Okutsu and, of Seattle, the idea sounded just uh, not right. Uh, for Jim and his brother, Gene, uh, at the camp at Minidoka, they said, enough is enough. Uh, you kicked us around long enough. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not going. Uh, at the same time, at Heart Mountain, Wyoming, uh, the Fair Play Committee is organizing to uh, hold informational meetings about uh, the unconstitutionality of the draft and the unconstitutionality of, the, of, of drafting men from a camp like this. And as you'll see in this film clip that I'm going to show you, about to show you, the only support they got in the press came from our friend, journalist James Omura of Winslow. Um, uh, Keep in mind, this is uh, by this time it's, it's two years into the into the mass imprisonment with no end in sight, and and the dominant narrative in the camp, again, was one of patriotic self-sacrifice and spilling of one's blood to prove one's loyalty to America, uh, and for sixty years, that was the dominant narrative in the Japanese American community, uh, which was mar then used to marginalize the story of the fellows you're about to see. Uh, this kind of made me so uh, crazy and frustrated that I, I made this film for PBS uh, called Conscience Constitution, and here's the key part of the story. It's, uh, it's uh, six, minutes, six minutes long. 1944 marked the second winter in camp. On New Year's Day, they pounded rice into mochi cakes just as if they were home. From overseas came word of heavy casualties among the first Nisei soldiers. The government announced it would now draft the young men in camp. As soon as I heard the news, or read the news, I was determined not to go. What's right is right, what's wrong is wrong, and government is wrong. For some, it was the last straw. At Heart Mountain, 
they organized, and Frank Emmy would lead them. An engineer named Kiyoshi Okamoto had been writing manifestos, calling himself the Fair Play Committee of One. He taught Emmy about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. With Okamoto as chair, the Fair Play Committee typed bulletins, held meetings, and elected officers. We collected uh, two dollars a piece from the Fair Play Committee members to uh, set up a fund in case we had to have legal uh, uh, action. Protests were raised at other camps, but they were unfocused and leaderless. These caught the eye of a journalist in the free zone of Denver. They were spouting out about their loyalty to Japan and stuff like that. And I felt that they were taking a wrong approach because they weren't disloyal, but out of frustration were making these wild statements. James Omura had publicly protested the mass incarceration. He said the JACL betrayed Japanese America by collaborating with the government. As editor of the Rocky Shimpo newspaper, his editorials fanned the growing resistance. And I felt that someone should throw out what I felt was an anchor that, the, that these people could use that would be substantial. The Nisei are well within their rights to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Beyond that, we couldn't say directly anything that would be critical of, of the, the United States government policy. So we had to be oblique about it. I couldn't tell the people to organize, but in essence, I was telling them to organize. Well, that really uh, helped us morally because uh, we felt that uh, James O'Murrow was uh, in our corner. We also felt that since this paper was being distributed in other camps, that it might stir up the other camps. Guntaro Kubota, a Japanese language school teacher trained in the law, translated the Fair Play bulletins into Japanese. I thought, gee, we have to fight for our rights. You know, that's all we know is this country. And so when my husband was asked to interpret what the uh, Fair Play boys were saying, I thought, well, that's the only way they could make the money, raise the money, because they knew eventually they're going to court. As the protest gained momentum, the first draft orders arrived in camp. I was 18 here at Heart Mountain when the loyalty questionnaires came up. At that time, I didn't have any problem. I was apolitical. I was a white person. I wanted to be drafted. I wanted to serve my country. The first group of draftees was told to report. When the day arrived, all 17 boarded the bus that took them to their pre-induction physicals. If the Fair Play Committee was to make a difference, it had to do more than protest. Some wavered. I remember arguing that if we don't take a definite stand, it's not going to do any good. At a packed mess hall rally, the Fair Play Committee crossed the line from protest to resistance. We feel the present program of drafting us from this concentration camp is unjust, unconstitutional, and against all principles of civilized usage. Therefore, we members of the Fair Play Committee hereby refuse to go to the physical examination or to the induction if or when we are called in order to contest the issue. If ever there was a time or... I didn't feel there was really a choice. We all had an obligation, a responsibility to publicize or to raise the issue of the incarceration, the uh, evacuation at whatever opportunity we had. This certainly presented an opportunity, one that um, uh, if we were to overlook it at this point, then we virtually accept 
the evacuation as a normal condition. I know my dad was 100% uh, behind me. I had no real concern about him. My mother, on the other hand, like the normal mother, was concerned. And at one point, uh, uh, even begged me to consider being like the rest of the guys and just go along and don't make waves. Within a week, five young men refused to board the bus. The next week, seven more failed to appear. The Fair Play Committee had a test case. So they go to court to, uh, they break a law to go to court, get a test case. And the point that Yosh makes at the end there is, is important. The draft resistance was a protest, not a protest against military service, like it was for many of us in the Vietnam era. Uh, it was a protest against the camps themselves, the last hook they could hang their hat on. Uh, so yes, they had a test case, but when they get to court, the judge in Wyoming in their bench trial refuses to hear any constitutional or moral arguments. Uh, he rules strictly on the letter of the law. You failed to report for induction, didn't show up, doesn't matter your reason, guilty. Draft activation. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, at Minidoka, uh, there is also no organization. Uh, Jim Okutsu and his uh, brother Gene refuse to report for induction on their own taken to jail in Wyoming, in, I'm sorry, in Idaho, uh, where they're tried for draft evasion. And just like the judge in Wyoming trial, a um, uh, federal judge refuses to allow the jury to consider any constitutional issues. A uh, jury takes uh, enough time to go out, smoke a cigarette, come back, return verdicts of guilty. Kind of mass, mass assembly line kangaroo court uh, in Idaho. Sentenced to uh, three years, three months in the uh, McNeil Island Federal Penitentiary, south of Seattle. Uh, so these are the three uh, major forms of camp resistance. Uh, refusing the questionnaire, refusing the draft, taking the case to the Supreme Court. Uh, were they celebrated for their principal stands in the case of Okutsu and, Hir and Hir uh, Kashiwagi? Uh, they were marginalized uh, by those who controlled the narrative of our Japanese-American community. Uh, you saw Paul, Paul Sumiishi there. Uh, let's go back to Paul, who saw firsthand how the draft resistors were treated by the community. As I became more familiar with them and came to know some of them, I realized that they were in a position of being ostracized still after all these decades, and they would not voluntarily come out and say who they were. We had very few resistors and people of conscience, probably only two or three, that would publicly surface at that time. And the rest of them are silent. Some because their wives don't want to be brought out into the open. And it wasn't just the wives. Uh, in, in Seattle, the mothers of those who served in the war turn on Jim Okutsu's mother uh, for having two sons whom they call draft dodgers. They cut her off, uh, tell her never to come back to church. And, and from the novel, No No Boy by John Okada, which I really encourage you to read, uh, uh, you know what tragically happens next. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, Jim's mother uh, takes her own life um, in despair uh, and isolation. Um, Hiroshi Kachiwagi returns to Sacramento on a, on a bright uh, sunny day only to find old friends from Tule Lake ignoring and ostracizing him with the term no-no boy used as a slur. And what kind of disturbs me most is how people in my community uh, embrace these labels of troublemaker, disloyal, pro-Japan, and no-no boy without uh, seeing how these divisions are created not just by the war, but by the actions of the government to sort and label its incarcerates, uh, and, and we bought right into them. Uh, I, so I want to close my presentation uh, by reading to you from the last page of our, of our graphic novel. Here's Hiroshi Kashiwagi uh, working as a librarian in San Francisco, describing how he fought for 10 years to get back his US citizenship that he had renounced at Tulu Lake. Uh, he says, um, after 35 years, can you imagine my chagrin my dismay when I learned there was no law that required draft age Nisei to answer that multi-questionnaire in camp. 
All those threats of prison and fines, all lies. I was angry all over again. At least I'm able to unburden myself with others who are cast out from our own community, even to this day. To be an American is a privilege I appreciate. And if there's one thing I've learned, it's that America must unburden itself too. The government was wrong to single us out for exclusion based solely on our race. It was wrong then, and it would be wrong now. And whenever we see America turn against a people because of their race or their religion or their whatever, we won't just stand by. We won't just go along. I will speak up. I will see that every person gets a fair hearing. I will be the friend we didn't have when we needed one the most. It happened to us. We refuse to let it happen again. So, all this is the story of camp as you've probably never heard before. It's a story of disrupting dominant narratives inside our own community and in the nation as a whole. Uh, so, I've covered a lot of territory, new territory in a way that doesn't often appear in other curriculums. If you do teach this subject matter yourself, as I perhaps, uh, I hope this opens some paths for you to approach it in a fresh way. Uh, to support you, we have a number of resources at this curriculum link at the Wing Luke Museum, uh, curriculum.wingluke.org. Uh, we've posted an online uh, timeline, a historical timeline uh, that you can follow uh, uh, all these stories along, and also an uh, educator's guide at that link we've developed with curriculum uh, experts uh, aligned with high school common core uh, standards, along with lesson plans and lists of sources that went into the writing of this book. I also have some, some postcards here with information, the bulk orders for the, no, for the graphic novel. Uh, the, the novel uh, just won uh, an, award, uh, an award from the Association uh, of King County Historical Organizations, uh, Virginia Folks Award for Outstanding uh, Original Research in a Historical uh, Publication. So with that, I'll stop there. And I'm really eager to hear all your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Frank. That was just amazing. Well, thank you. What a great audience you've been. I mean, I'm just astonished. This is the best audience I've ever, ever had, so thank you. <laughs> We'd like to open it up for questions, yeah, if really. people have any. Just raise your hand, and we'll come along with you for um, with a mic. I'm just curious um, what led you to uh, pursue telling these stories in the form of a graphic novel um, versus other mediums? I mean, let me make that a two-part question. Um, but the first part, why a graphic novel, uh, doing a graphic novel was not on my radar at all. Uh, I was, in fact, working on a stage play version of some of this material, um, which more to come on that, not, not today. Uh, uh, hopefully in two years from now, you'll, you'll see something on that locally. Um, the Wing Luke Museum uh, got a grant from the National Park Service uh, for a series of three graphic novels, uh, one of which, the first, Nisei Soldiers, uh, the second, Camp Resistance, and the third, uh, White Allies, who helped us at the time. Uh, it's called, the book's called Those Who Helped Us. And um, what's interesting is that the very fact that they had a, a slot in their proposal for Camp Resistance is I want, to, I want to claim credit for that in the, in the work that I and the Omori sisters and Eric Muller did 20 years ago to begin telling the stories of, dra of the Draftry sisters. And, and that created a space which really hadn't existed before in the, in the Japanese American community, which was discussion of camp resistance. So uh, they put out a call for proposals, and we, you know, four of us answered it, and we were selected, and, and we took us four years to do it. Um, but the, the, the bigger question of why I'm interested in the subject matter as a whole <coughs> is, again, as you can probably tell, one of frustration. I, I grew up as a child of the 60s. I was, by the way, someone asked me, what camp was I in? I, I was not, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> um, not that, I, I was born in 1951, 1951 uh, in Cleveland, Cleveland, Ohio after the war. Um, uh, but, but I grew up in the 60s, and you know, uh, we, I came of age, with this, I'm a sansei, third generation Japanese American. And um, you know, we would ask our, our parents, you know, mom, dad, why didn't you resist? 
and uh, we would be greeted with, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I would, we would say, you know, if, we, if it happened to me, I, I wouldn't have gone. You know, I would have said no. no. And, and the prevailing attitude at the time was, you know, uh, well, you're, you're young, you know, uh, times were different then. Uh, you know, uh, you, you, can't, you cannot go applying your Berkeley civil rights activism in the 60s to, to World War II. Times are different. You can't judge us. You know. uh, but when we discovered uh, 20, 30 years ago the, the existence of these draft resistors, who, as you saw, were making a principled stand on the Constitution and their manifestos and quoting Abraham Lincoln and the, all the amendments of the Constitution, you know, I realized, well, the Constitution wasn't an invention of the 60s. It actually you know, existed in the 1940s. And, and so there was something that was not lining up uh, to uh, me and my generation. Uh, the, other, the other part, to answer your question, is uh, <clears throat> why, why the story of camp resistance. Um, growing up again in the 60s, the, uh, the prevailing notion uh, in our community was that our response as, as a group to this massive violation of civil rights in the American 20th century could be characterized in one of two terms. Uh, one Jap a Japanese term, shikata ganai, which is Japanese for it can't be helped. Uh, passive resignation in the face of injustice. And, and the other was go for broke, you know, Hawaiian pigeon for go all, go all out, give 110%. Uh, as I said before, you know, uh, spilling one's blood for America, prove you're just as American as everyone else. And neither of those two extremes kind of rang true for me. Uh, and, and discovering Frank Emmy and those others 20 years ago uh, was like finding the missing link. It was like a door opening. And so uh, it led me down this path of doing the documentary and then doing a book about John Okada, the author of No No Boy biography, and then this graphic novel. Uh, so kind of um, skipping between genres to t basically tell the same story. Uh, but at least with, with the graphic novel expanding the universe of resistance to uh, go beyond the Fair Play Committee to include uh, Jim Okutsu, Mitsuya Endo, and the more difficult subject of of the loyalty questionnaire in Tudor Lake, which, which I just told you. Uh, that was something that I wanted to, uh, Barbara Takei of the, to, the Tudor Lake Committee, you know, we, we had, she said, oh, Frank, you did a great job with, with that draft, hard, hard mountain film. I wish we could do something for Tudor Lake, you know, really uh, explain and co contextualize the, 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 the Tudor Lake no-nos and renunciants. And I said, you know, doggone it, you know, we should, we should, we should do that. <laughs> And so, and that was kind of the, the driver for me of the graphic novel was telling the, the Tudor Lake story. Uh, it was an opportunity to kind of explore that and, and, and flesh it out. But thank you. When you were growing up, did you know these stories? Were they told to you as a child? Were they held back from you because of family? Or I grew up in Maine. Yeah. I didn't even know about it until I came out here. I just didn't even know. It. The answer is no. No, and this is very typical for my generation is that our parents, who those of us who had parents in camp, my father was in camp, my mother was a Kibanese who was taken back to Japan from San Jose, taken to Japan from San Jose for, for family reasons. Um, uh, my father would, uh, he mentioned to Heart Mountain once, Heart Mountain, and he, he made it sound like, he said it was a camp, and, but he made it sound like it was a summer camp for teenagers, right? And I go, I'm at UC Santa Cruz, nothing, nothing in high school, nothing in college, but I go to UC Santa Cruz, go, go home one summer, and open up Bill Hosokawa's book, Nisei, Nisei the Quiet Americans, and I see these pictures of Heart Mountain, and there's this barbed wire and guard towers, machine guns, <laughs> <laughs> holy mackerel, you know. Uh, so what is this? And that was my, my uh, door, you know, door opening there, is um, we all, all of us, even, you know, Fred Korematsu's daughter, uh, oh, James Omura's kids, he never, he never told them that he went to federal prison, a um, federal trial, uh, or was married previously, but had, <laughs> that he had been tried for conspiracy in federal court, along with the Fair Play Committee. Uh, yeah, they just, our, our parents' generation wanted to protect us from being bitter or angry and wanted us to assimilate, uh, but uh, we, we, we worked, we, we found a way around that, you know. And, and so now are, are recovering these stories. Yeah, thanks. Oh, uh, be, be, uh, before I hold that question. So, um, oh, go ahead. Actually, 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 I'll, I'll walk it up later. I just wanted to clarify, in Endo's uh, argument for the, uh, the case, 
was it was it that, that there was no um, constitutional basis for the long-term incarceration, or was it that there was no executive uh, order that defined what that basis was? Are you a lawyer? No, no, I just, I like legal stuff. Though, you know. Good. No. <laughs> I mean that very nicely because you, you seem to know that's a very crucial, that's a very fine distinction you're making. Uh, the the Nitsi Endo case is a, the, 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 the three Korematsu, Hiramashi Asui, and the drafters are all, are all criminal cases. They actually broke a curfew or the exclusion order or the Selective Service Act, so they broke a law. Endo's case was a civil case. Uh, it was a habeas corpus petition. Uh, habeas corpus is Latin for produce the body. I don't know exactly what that means, but it, it means that it makes, it, it makes the government prove a cause why they're holding you, why they're holding you in prison. You can't, you can't hold my body without, without a reason. And, and so it was a civil case. And so the Endo, when the Supreme Court ruled in Endo's case, it did not address any, cons it, it, what's the word? It, it avoided uh, any constitutional issues uh, in, in, his, in, in the opinion that they wrote. Uh, it, it just it simply ruled that the, uh, the government under, the, under existing statutes did not have, or the executive order, did not have any authority to detain American citizens who were admittedly loyal to the US, did not have the right to detain them for an indeterminate amount of time. You could do it, so the argument at the Supreme Court according to um, Peter Irons in Justice at War, has a wonderful uh, description that we used in, in, the, in the graphic novel. Justices are arguing with uh, the uh, Solicitor General of the US uh, saying, well, can you hold me for 25 years? Or 50, you know, is, is 50 years too long? You know, well, what, what's, what's a reasonable time you can hold me without uh, proving a cause? And, and the government said, uh, no, 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 Your Honor, I, I, we, we give up, we give up. And, uh, uh, Endo, Endo's case prevailed. But it was only on, on the legal question of how long can the government hold you? And the answer was not, not forever, without cause. Clarence, I'm, Chris, you okay. shout Can I book a Clarence next? I was wondering if you could speak any more about the connection between the loyalty oath questionnaire and the, the draft, was, it, was there a premeditated rationale behind when the loyalty oath questions were being administered to use that as a rationale to be able to, do, to draft Japanese Americans while they were in concentration camp? That's a very good question. And uh, the answer is no, because um, I, I, I kind of uh, made off uh, comment before that this was all ad hoc. This is all made up as they went along. You know, World War II was happening. The, the government had no experience with, you know, a war relocation authority. Um, and it had no experience with um, loyalty questionnaires in this, in this context. So, I mean, what happens in January 43 with the questionnaire, it had a specific objective, which was to undo the um, bad PR about the, the Japanese being disloyal. And, and, and give an opportunity to, to prove themselves on a questionnaire so they could be released for jobs in the Midwest or for service in the Army. There was no, they're not looking ahead. It's, it, everything was uh, of the moment. So the, the draft comes one year after the questionnaire and, and there, was, uh, there was no premeditation, there's no connection between the two, um, except in, in people's, in the, in, in popular, in the popular mind, people often think of the draft resistors as no-no no -no boys. Uh, and I mean, no-no boy became a kind of catch-all category or slur for uh, those who protested in some way. But in fact, the film clip I showed you, the Hart Mountain Boys, were all predominantly yes, yes on the questionnaire. Uh, they, they did object to the questionnaire, a lot of those guys uh, who, but they answered yes, eventually. Um, uh, the, this, this confusion in the popular mind is, is uh, uh, not helped by the publication in 1957 uh, of a novel by a Seattle man named John Okada, who, who was living in Detroit at the time. He writes a novel called No-No Boy. And, and, and uh, it just makes me crazy because No-No Boy is about 
a draft resistor from Minidoka, who spends two years in camp and two years in prison. Uh, he's clearly uh, a draft resistor and not uh, someone who's, uh, was, he was not at Tule Lake, uh, as I said, as a segregee. But th this, this kind of just further uh, confuses the, uh, the issue. Yeah. Thank you. It's not, not a question. I just want to have a closing comment. First of all, as I understand it, habeas corpus is, if you're going to accuse me of murder, show me the body. Yes. Right? That's it. Um, secondly, uh, I love how there's always a one degree separation on this island. Frank Amy, uh, people know uh, Faith Chapel, who was our longtime superintendent here. Well, that was her uncle. And um, she didn't know, that she learned out about this in her adult years, that, that her uncle Frank, the handsome uncle Frank, he was a very striking, she said, God, he was so handsome. She said, if he wasn't my uncle. But anyway. Kathleen, uh, <laughs> Kathleen Emmy. That's yeah. right, she's in Bainbridge. I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah. Right, yeah. and so she said, um, she didn't understand why Frank was always, um, persona non grata at all family events and all this stuff, and then she finally realized he was this resistor. But she didn't learn that until she was an adult. So, you know, these things, these things, I always like to say there's 120,000 stories and they're so complicated. So, right, and then I just want to close, because um, I've known you for a long time. Frank is an incredible leader. He was a fabulous journalist and a good spokesperson, but I think his real passion, first, he's a pretty good actor. And uh, doing Conscience in the Constitution was a real landmark piece for our community. Um, you opened up eyes for a lot of people within the Japanese community with that documentary. It was aired on PBS, which then opened up a lot of people's eyes. You graciously came here five years ago and, and did our c celebration and uh, a panel, and now you're doing it here. Um, your work is, is a legacy for our community. I just want to thank you, and I'm, I'm so proud of you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Clarence. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that we had time to go on with a lot more. Um, Frank will be available a little bit after uh, to take questions if you'd like to talk with him. But I would like to, to sincerely thank all of you for coming out today. Um, you know, it, it's, it's seeing audiences like this that are, that are interested in the history, interested in learning more, um, and uh, experiencing some of this through the art that we showed at BIMA as well. For, for me, it just makes my job such a pleasure. So thank you all for coming today. Thank you. Best audience ever. Thank you. Thank you.